I sound so good on paper, don't I? <laughs> well, um, there were a number of special thanks that rolled by at the end of the film, and I noted one name in there, Peggy Reisky, um, who is here tonight, the director of the film Trevor, which screened previously in this series, and is the reason that Kathy is here tonight, actually, because when Peggy was there uh, with, her, with her film a couple of weeks ago, we mentioned that we were screening Parting Glances, and she was like, oh, well, Kathy's one of my oldest friends. I'm just going to call her. And in the courtyard out here, Peggy hands me her phone, and I get on the phone with Kathy and uh, start the gears in motion for you to be here. And now you're here. So thank you, Peggy, again, for your contributions to this film and to bringing Kathy here tonight. So um, I wanted to get started by taking a little tour of your career up to this moment, <laughs> up to the moment that uh, that you met Bill Sherwood um, before, you know, when this film was just sort of a twinkle in his eye. Tell us a little bit about your path leading up to this. Dull. It was very dull. <laughs> I, um, you know, I had, uh, we're, Peggy and I are both from Wisconsin, and, uh, I had no intention of being an actress, and that, that was the thing that I really do owe my career to Bill Sherwood, because I think not since the oldest son has been forced into the family business <laughs> did anyone have less choice than I did, because he really, really pushed me. You know, I was sort of like, well, I didn't, I really absolutely did not intend on being any kind of performer, but... Bill was one of those people, and I've always said this, either you really liked him or you didn't. You know, he was just that kind of guy. I mean, I happen to really like him. We were both uh, only children, and we sort of got along in that way, but he was very controlling. And I ended up knowing him because uh, my friend Cindy Ratzlaff, who's my writing partner, uh, hated to do anything by herself, so she always made uh, people hire me wherever she worked. She just didn't want to be there by herself, even though I had absolutely no skills as a secretary or an assistant of any kind. We worked at the American Psychiatric Association. <laughs> I mean, we ran the New York County District Branch of the American Psychiatric <laughs> Association, the mental health of New York City. <laughs> Two women in bib overalls, you know. And, um, and then Cindy moved to WCBS-TV, and she made them hire me. I was a statistical typist. Again, one, five, six, like that. And um, Bill Sherwood worked there. They, we needed a temp. They hired him, and it was the three of us. And basically, we ran that place. And, that's, and that was where we were working. When First, he wrote another movie um, for me, and uh, Quentin Crisp if anyone remembers him. And Quentin was already, he, I mean, what a great and amazing individual, but he, his memory was sort of, he just really didn't want to learn any lines. And uh, you know, he just didn't. And uh, so Bill decided that wasn't going to work, and then he wrote Parting Glances and, uh, while we were working there at CBS. And I was teaching improvisational comedy with my friend Cindy, again, because she didn't want to do that by herself. <laughs> and uh, that was the start of my career. And Parting Glances was the first movie that I ever did. So when, um, did you talk to Bill as he was writing the script? Did he write Joan with you in mind? Was it based on someone he knew, someone else he knew? What Tell us about the development of her as a character. I, I think that it, the entire movie was really about his life. And um, I mean, we're all from the Midwest. He was from Battle Creek, Michigan. And uh, he was a musician. And uh, that's why you see in the credits that he directed and all the music was everything that he chose. Mm -hmm. And he, <laughs> every part of that movie was that characters were part of him. And with Joan, I don't, really know why he wrote it and who he wrote it. I mean, he wrote it for me, but I, I really don't know what I had to do with it other than he just wrote it. And I remember one day he said to me, well, how do you feel about Joan being gay? And I was like, she's not gay, you know? And he was like, you know, and uh, 
obviously she was gay. And, you know, <laughs> so I don't know. One day he's, when we, he was directing this classic Bill Sherwood. He said to me, could you be more ambiguous? <laughs> and I said, no, could you? <laughs> you know, it was that, that kind of situation. And uh, he just, he was an amazing man. He had that one movie in him and he did it. And, you know, I, I'm so grateful that it's uh, still around, that it's, it's here, that it could be that shining moment for him and for everybody in it where I watched it, at, we were like nine years old. It was very, <laughs> very odd to watch. Yeah, uh, I mean, for those in the audience who don't know, I don't think we really mentioned this in the um, introduction, but in the program um, notes, it does mention that this was Bill's only film mm -hmm. and uh, this has an 85, 1985 copyright mark, but this premiered at the 1986 yeah. Sundance Film Festival and then four years later, I believe he died in 1990, mm -hmm. right? So this, when you say this is the one film he added in, you know, that I, I would hope that he was wanting to make more and there's a great interview with with him uh, that I found online. It's just like a press junket thing with a journalist and he's talking about um, other films that other people are making and he's like, yeah, I'm available, hire me. You know, like he seemed eager to work. Yeah, that wasn't true. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, when you were saying that, I remember that um, I had, uh, I moved out here from New York and uh, he came out here, they had hired him to direct an episode of 30 something. And um, so he came out here and I drove him around and he bought me this really expensive pair of sunglasses. And I said, you know, you didn't have to do that. And he said, you know, I, I'm not married, I don't have any children and I don't have anything else to do with my money, just take them. <laughs> and, and I said, well, if you're gonna be so gracious about it, all right, you know. And um, he only lasted out here about maybe two weeks and then he, he said that's it I don't I don't want to do this this is not the kind of thing I want to direct mm -hmm. and he went back to New York and he never did direct anything after that he was very much you know I mentioned that he was an only child because that that was really the thing that defined him mm -hmm. uh you know you just he I told him in if if he wanted me in the movie, he had to come and take some improvisational comedy classes. And um, so he did. And But his idea of being in a scene, you know, where you say yes, and, and you don't argue, and you always agree, was to grab you by the shirt and go, and now we're going over here. You know, and it was just, he, he always made me laugh. He was so funny. Classic Bill Sherwood, the very first time um, he asked me to go to a party with him, and he lived on the Upper West Side, and I lived Midtown, and so we were going down to the village. the The woman who played Liesel, uh, you know, Angela, was having a party and downtown. So I went to get on the subway. I was meeting him down there, and there he was. He was sitting right there on the car that I got on, and I was like, "Oh my God! I can't believe that!" You know. This is the car that I got on of all the cars, and you're here, and I'm here, and he goes, it happens all the time, just get over it. <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. And uh, that was, you know, I mean, that was Bill Sherwood, and uh, so, so creative and so controlling, <laughs> you know, but, and you could see it in, in the movie, but he was um, such a funny guy, you know what I mean, entertaining and charming and, completely obsessed with MTV when it came out. He just watched it for hours. It's great that it makes its way into the film with, yeah. with uh, Steve Buscemi's character being obsessed with seeing himself on it. Yeah. yeah. So you uh, tell us a little bit more about the party scene, which is so, I forget every time I watch this, how long it is. It's I like oh, half of the movie is in this party scene, which is really fabulous to spend so much time with all of these characters and see all of this nuance of this very specific scene. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about what he was like directing that scene and how, because there's so much going on and it feels so natural. I think, first of all, it was about 300 degrees in there. <laughs> it was unbelievably hot. And um, all those people 
were some part of Bill's life. They'd either gone to school with him, like uh, Ted, the German who was playing the piano was, he and Bill had this love-hate relationship. They had been competitive in uh, the music academy or whatever it was called, the, the conservatory that they had gone to. And they really, right up until the end, they just ha hated each other. Loved, hated each other, it was amazing. But I, I looked around in that party scene, I had forgotten every single person that was in there either uh, knew Bill or they knew somebody else, they'd all gone to circle in the square or whatever, but at the end of the, the whole thing when we were finally done shooting there, which was a loft I think in Brooklyn that were friends of Bill's, I remember everybody saying to themselves, never rent your home to a film crew because we destroyed that place, <laughs> totally. I mean, totally, because everybody was just green as grass. We would, you know, you were like throwing stuff around or whatever. The the people were, I think, I don't think they were ever friends with Bill again. And, um, but that, I don't know how long it took us to shoot that forever and ever, but each one of those characters was so amazing. There were people that I met there while shooting that that I'm still friends with. Uh, it was just so interesting uh, to see all those that you know the guy is like I've got a you know a box in Paris and a blah 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 you know he was just so brilliant and Bill was the kind of guy that he would walk down the street and he would see you and he would go are you an actor do you want to be in a movie I'm no I really am I'm directing and writing do you want to be in a movie and nine times out of ten they go yeah. Uh, you know, everybody is an actor in New York, but they go, yeah, there was something about him that they wanted to be in his movie, and they all were. And e you either were in the movie or you invested money in the movie, and then you got to be in the movie anyway. So, interesting guy. Yeah, and it sounds like a big part of the, at least the way that Christine sort of described it, is that it was shooting in fits and starts because he would raise, raise some money here, and then yeah. friends would give him some money, and then... You know, he, he it was very piecemeal, like almost like a Kickstarter of yeah. its own day, but like Kickstarter of like asking friends and family for money. So was that is that your memory of it? That was kind of fits and starts and catches catch can. When he when we started filming the parts that I were in, we just did it. I mean, it seemed like it went on. And what what I remember, and the irony is, uh, after we were done with the. Or was it before? This is the thing about growing older, you know. He actually d wrote a bunch of little skits that he called fits and starts. <laughs> and um, we put it on on the Upper West Side, and it was just, uh, it was him getting ready, I think, to do the movie. Um, it's, a, I'm sure you asked me something important, but I was, I think that's no, a, I, fits I was and just starts. Asking, I was just asking about the, you know, just the, the very low budget nature oh, of this low film budget. Yeah. and how, yeah. Here's how low budget it was, okay. If you remember the guy from the party, he's kind of a uh, shaved head, l long ponytail, just flopping over, that was Franco. He was the makeup guy and he didn't feel like showing up most of the time. <laughs> and so I would do everybody's makeup at the party scene and then Franco would show up and he would do mine. And by the time he got there, he was so angry because it took him so long that just, I go, that hurts a little bit, you know, <laughs> ow, ow. You know, he just, it was, it was that kind of thing. I, I remember being there when, uh, and helping to be an assistant director. If you were there, you were part of it. You took on whatever role was needed. And, and I think the person that most uh, epitomizes that was Dan Hoy, who cast it and also played the, you know, the guy in the uh, night's thing saying, we're whispering because we have, you know. And I, he was just brilliant. And he yeah. really did everything that needed to be done and more. And everybody did it. And they did it for Bill because, like I said, you either liked him, uh, you know, a lot or you didn't. And even some of the people who didn't like him were in the movie. But <laughs> he just inspired a certain kind of loyalty. Yeah, and did anybody catch Christine in the yes. party scene? I did. <laughs> yes. It's very quick. Yeah. Um, what was it like working with? You have such a, a sweet, sweet relationship with Richard in this film, Michael's yeah. character, or yeah. the the guy who plays Michael. Um, talk a little bit about working with him and and what your memories are of that. I didn't. Uh, I didn't know him before. He was a student at Circle in the Square, 
and uh, like I said, then and a lot of people were, but we were both from Wisconsin, and he did end up back in Wisconsin. And I haven't talked to him for a few years, but um, so I didn't know him very well. And you know, just like with all filmmaking, often you're just thrown into something. And I don't think, you know, like I said, I didn't plan on being an actress. So you know, you find yourself in these situations, and you're like, how do you act? how do you act like somebody else who likes somebody else? You know, it just was, and, and try to be more ambiguous as you do it, you know. But um, <laughs> I, I think we shot this, uh, the really intense scenes of our friendship in this room that was kind of all built off in this loft, and literally it was 300 degrees in there. And so you just, you, you're not really uh, acting, you're just sort of sweating and hoping that the scene will end soon. But I remember, you know, really liking Richard and seeing um, his eagerness to be alive and to be as good as he could be. And I know that we were both trying to do that. And actually the, the person that I knew was Steve Buscemi. And um, I didn't have any scenes with him, so, Bill said, oh, just improv something. You know, I'm like, oh, okay. So he did. And I, you know, I think at that time I really had a crush on Steve. He was, too, and I think it, I see that when I see that scene, because I'm like, I couldn't even look at him, you know. I just thought that he was just, I, I had taken Bill downtown to um, see Steve perform. We always used to perform at a, uh, it used to be called Folk City, probably might still be, I don't know. But there was no longer folk music, it was comedy. And I did improvisational comedy down there with uh, some people. And then Steve and his comedy partner, Mark Boone Jr., would do some of the funniest, funniest things, little skits that I'd ever seen. So I took Bill down there to see Steve because he'd been recommended by uh, Vicky uh, to that he was perfect for it, and then it just all fell into place, and he really was so perfect for it. And again, I just I love seeing how young he looks in there, and all, all, all the people, everybody's just so young, except for Ted, who evidently was always old, and nobody liked him, like I said. But it was really uh, an interesting, the whole thing was just interesting, because it was knit together in this little tiny way and then presented as this whole thing. It's always, every time I see it, I'm like, well, how does this end? Yeah. I don't <laughs> don't remember until I see it. Steve is really so striking in this movie. Yeah, um, he's good. And so when, when the film premiered at Sundance, were you there for that? Uh, no, I didn't even, I don't know where I was. Maybe I'd moved out here by that time. Yeah, but the, so the film won, wait, I want to get this right, it's the special jury recognition in 1986, and um, we just had Gus Van Sant here with Malanoche, which premiered the same year, and he said on this stage that Malanoche did not get into Sundance that year because Parting Glances was the gay movie that year. Desert Hearts also screened, also won an award, but that was the lesbian movie that year, so they were you know, just filling these very small <laughs> boxes there. Um, but what, outside of, you know, so it premiered at Sundance, and then it had this rollout across the country in different major cities and smaller cities, what was the reception like at the time? What did what do you remember the reaction being when people you knew saw it? I think that and to this day, I've had so many people say to me, so many men uh, say to me, this was the movie who made that made me feel that I could have a life. This was the movie that uh, impressed me that I was normal. And I, th I think that that was the reception more than anything. I know that there was also that movie, My Beautiful Laundrette, but this was really one of the first movies about with a character that had AIDS or that whole, the whole life, uh, that whole group, that tight-knit group of friends that uh, Bill had. And it, it was so important because it's that thing, you know, if you can, if you see it, you can be it. And I think he knew that even then. And so I've always felt that that was the most important thing about it. 
was that, that it gave so many people hope that it was okay, that they were okay. And though the film you know, doesn't explicitly, like Christine said, the word AIDS is never uttered in this film. Mm -hmm. HIV is never said in this film. Oh, he says it once. Okay, just once. Um, but that was an intentional choice. Um, and I think it's so um, kind of devastating to think about the fact that five, I think it's like five months, half a year before this film came out, was the first time infamously that Reagan said the word AIDS ever, like just five months before this movie came out. So just the impact of that, like I think it, it has that, you know, sort of gravity toward it or, or about it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know if you have anything else to say about like the, where am I going here? Sort of the, the, the importance of that as being just a lived part of life as someone who can live a full life while also, you know, having AIDS. Is that something that, that you were all talking about or thinking about? I think it was pretty early on, although everybody in New yeah. York was talking about it and knew about it. And uh, and Bill already knew that he had AIDS, but he didn't really, he didn't tell anybody. And, you know, I'm sure the movie <laughs> kind of hastened the illness for him because he didn't really, he worked so hard on it and he didn't really take care of himself. And you often see him walking down the street going to an editing studio with a giant, like two quarts of Diet Coke dangling from his hand. That's how he, he just drank it until he was almost crazy. You know, I mean, Diet Coke will do that to you, I guess. But um, it was, uh, I think every time I see it, I'm, I'm struck more and more. Again, you know, you, th you go, okay, what, what am I supposed to do in life? And for Bill, that movie was it. It was, uh, you know, if you only had one movie in you, then that was the movie. And because it's just been uh, so important, I, I'll never even know how important it was. And I remember after I'd moved here and finally, you know, I mean, again, with, because Bill just pushed me, pushed me to be an actor. And after I'd lived here for about 15 years, I guess, you know, I thought, well, maybe I'm supposed to leave. Maybe I'm not supposed to be an actress. Maybe I'm supposed to, you know, go back somewhere else. And that night I had a dream. And for some reason, the dream took place in Vancouver. I don't know. But I was waiting for a bus and looking around thinking, yeah, I got to go. And then across the way was Bill Sherwood going, just stay there. Just stay there. Right. Just stay there. And I was like, stay? Oh, okay. And I thought, you know, he never did anything uh, sweetly or nicely. Even in my dream, he was just yelling at me. And um, I woke up and it just, it just made me laugh. He, you know, you all hope, always hope that you can leave a little part of yourself that moves on, that stays in the world. And he did. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to have met him, happy to have known him, to have called him a friend. I think that his creativity, wh whether he knew what he was doing, if he just wanted to show uh, this huge slice of his life, or if he knew that how important it was to show that, uh, you know, we're all more alike than different, that we're all just friends who want friends, who want to be loved, you know. I, I don't know if he, I could get credit him with that, but he certainly um, did a good thing. Yeah. I did want to leave time for a couple of audience questions, just in case anyone has one. Blue, um, my favorite color. We um. have a microphone coming to you. Yeah. Hi. Um, First thing, like, loved you in the movie, loved you in the role. Um, this is actually my second time seeing this movie. The first time I was really stricken by, uh, you know, before watching the movie, me and my friend, we were just kind of like chatting about gay shit, you know, as you do. And we were talking about, you know, just kind of like, um, you know, we're, we're about in our 30s. We were talking about, you know, like younger generations, et cetera. And... Then we watched the movie, and what really struck me was 
just how much I saw like my own friend group in the movie and also the scene where Steve Buscemi like asked that kid like what are you a Republican like just after me my friend had complained about like some younger kid you know uh, so it was all really it just really struck me how lived in and like how much my experience was reflected in the film um, so that's just me raining praise on you guys but my question is you mentioned that um, you had done uh, improv improvisational comedy I'm sorry could you just talk a little louder I'm so oh, old yeah sorry my my mask I think is blocking it too the question is about improvisational comedy yeah um, so you had done improvisational comedy um, and in the film, a lot of the dialogue is just very naturalistic. Was that all um, on Bill's part, or was there also a lot of improv improvisation allowed? No, he he really <laughs> impressed on me. And coming from the background of improvisation, that a writer uh, works very hard yeah. with each <laughs> word, and you need to get every single word the way I wrote it. <laughs> And, you know, and it terrorized me for the rest of my career, to tell you the truth, you know. But um, the only the only scene that was improvised was that scene between Steve and I where he's like, I'm going to beat him up. I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to, you know, that was the only one. And I, and I still don't know why he did that. Why he actually said, oh, just improv something, which was, you know, in the in hindsight, it was an incredible honor because he was so controlling, and of course he could have just cut the whole thing out, but he but he let us have that, and uh, that was good. But yeah, and then I went on to billions of years of improvisational comedy across the world. So, but nope, this is all that's that's the thing. That's the knack. So I should thank you because that's the knack of acting. You want it to look uh, like you're just making it up right then, but know every word <laughs> so thanks well, awesome you did great and everyone involved with the movie i mean again thank you all so much i really i mean the movie really blasted me by like just showing you know again my experience like that was the first movie i really saw where it was like oh like this is actually a group of queer friends and it really it really meant a lot so thank you again Other questions from the audience? Yeah, we have a mic coming to you. Um, as an artist, um, this is my first movie of his that I've seen, obviously the only one now that I know Duck that. Duck. Um, okay, I will speak up, apologies, I'm a little nervous. Um, I liked the underlying theme, at least, at least this is what I picked up, of just the artist and the struggle of that. Yeah. And even that like little bit, I suppose, about Michael, um, you know, I gotta buy me a computer, right? And like, it's gonna be four grand. And he's like, it's too much, I'm not gonna do that. And he's like, just try paper, you know? So for me, like, to see um, Steve's room, like I wanted to ask, I guess, how much of those little quirks, right? Like the cockroach frequency, like the TVs, like every detail of that set was just unbelievable. And it mm -hmm. felt like, for me, it felt like I'm allowed to be messy. You know, it's like, I saw that. I've been criticized for that my whole life. And it's like, you know what? that looked like the coolest room I've ever fucking seen, you know? And so just, I don't know if he meant to, or I don't know if he struggled at all during the process, but it came together so beautifully, but I also loved those moments of, of hardship, right? Because art is hard. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's where he came from. That's everybody that was there came from some kind of uh, arts background that were all struggling and, what what was fun for me this time was that that was everything except for the party was shot in Bill's apartment and then the the dinner party was shot somewhere else with Cecil and you know uh, that was some some other apartment that probably he lost those friends as well I imagine you know <laughs> but um, everything else Steve's apartment and uh, Michael and Robert's apartment were all shot in Bill's apartment. He had this huge pre-war multi-roomed apartment on the Upper West Side that was just it was gorgeous and it was painted terracotta, which was you know a fascinating color at that time to me anyway. But um, <laughs> He, everything that you saw there was, came from some part of him, either it was part of his 
creativity or someone, uh, he'd seen it someplace else, but the TVs, the, the cigarettes covering the money, that was all his, all the, all the artwork. Like when I saw that whack thing, I was like, oh my God. I'd forgotten about all, all of those things. They were in his apartment and he just used them. His visual, his ear, his hearing of the whole movie and the dialogue and the music and then his visual, what he wanted was just so exact. But it was his life, completely about his life and his friends' lives. Art. I think uh, I, I just wanted to kind of come to a close here because I'm just so thrilled. One that you know to work for an institution that has restored this film. I feel very honored to be part of it. Of you know such a place that is honoring this work, and that print looked beautiful. Oh my gosh, I mean, we're so lucky to have seen that on 35 millimeter. Um, and I just love what a time capsule it is in certain ways. I mean, from my, the terracotta is one thing, but the blue office is like so, that would be in like, a, like you know, a catalog today. It's amazing. Um, but I did just want to like kind of bring it back around to the series and the fact that we're including this in the Pioneers of Queer Cinema series. And I think that part of what makes this film so memorable and so indelible for so many of us here, um, for me as a straight person, for some of the folks here in the room who might be straight too, I just wanted to end with a quote from Harvey Firestein about the movie, if you don't mind. Um, when people say to me, your work is not really gay work, which this film has been accused of, right? It's, everyone said, this is universal, which I can kind of agree with. Uh, I say, up yours. It's gay. And you can take it and translate it for your own life, and that's very nice, but at last, I don't have to do the translating. You do. And I think that's something about this film that's so special and unique, and I'm so glad that you were a part of this film and that you were here to share your experience with us and to let us learn a, bit, a little bit more um, about Bill through you. So thank you so much for being here, Kathy. This was really great. Thank you.